Good afternoon and welcome to UCA's online public lecture. Happy New Year to everyone. My name is Shokat Ali Khan, and I'm the Chief Information Officer here at the University of Central Asia. I hope you are all doing great. We have an exciting topic today, innovations in ICT and technology and potential ramifications for society from mobile phones to AI, 5G and robotics. I'm really happy to announce our today's speaker, who's a well-known uh, technology figure around the world. Our today's speaker is Professor Dr. J John Pere Offred, co-founder and president of the International Academy of CIOs. JP Offred is a currently co-founder and the current president of the International Academy of CIOs, an NGO headquartered in Tokyo, Japan with the objectives of fostering the exchange and adoption of best practices from CIOs and IT executive leadership. It also promotes the application and innovation of ICT, such as mobile phones, internet of things, and AI in areas including aging society, smart cities, and natural disasters. He is also director for the Center for Assurance Research and Engineering, in the Valgeno School of Engineering and Director of Research Partnerships at the School of Business at George Mason University, and also a visiting lecturer at Duke University Center for International Development. Please welcome JP Offred. Uh, uh, thank you very much, um, Shokta Ali Khan, and, and, and um, th thank you to all of your colleagues and, and at University of Central Asia and in, in the region. It's a great pleasure joining you today. Um, um, as um, Dr. Ali Khan described, the talk today is gonna innovations in ICT and technology and will be about 30 minutes long and then um, some time for questions and, and, and answers. Uh, but thank you very much for, for, for joining. <laughs> um, talk itself and provide a little bit of, of background on major world trends and then talk more specifically about AI, robotics, drones, um, autonomous vehicles and open data. It's a <laughs> very exciting time in the technology field, but also quite challenging too, especially with uh, COVID-19, so a time of, of great opportunity, but also tremendous risks. Um, some of the major themes and, and, and trends is the growing and increasing importance of technology for society and technology for international development. Uh, this is a, a picture from a World Economic Forum event uh, in Kigali, Rwanda, highlighting the, the, the need and the importance um, with the sustainable development goals of technology across the range of societies. Um, also too, in, in, in Kazakhstan, um, technology being a key part of, of, of their view for, for international development and, and growing the economy, but not just these two co countries, company, countries around the world. Um, some of the, the, the challenges though, um, relate to the, the uh, ability, capability of, of, of leadership, uh, the, uh, policies that countries adopt, and also standards. Um, here's an example from Japan. About 10 years ago, there was the thought that Japan was somewhat like a, a Galapagos Islands uh, for biology and for, for life, um, where Japan was really fantastic at developing new technologies such as smartphones, <laughs> but had difficulty in um, developing the corresponding ecosystems around the world. And we see this too today, um, that, that different standards both help um, companies and, and countries with innovation, but also can be a hindrance. Um, <laughs> of course, COVID-19 has had a, a, a major impact worldwide, health-wise and economically. Um, countries have, have utilized technology both to combat the um, pandemic, but also the economic aftermath and really trying to foster digital resilience. Um, in Taiwan, a very successful approach to combating um, the pandemic 
<laughs> utilizing IT and the, the basis they have uh, through digital government over the last 20 years, the foundation that they've set through investments. <laughs> so quite early on in, in early January of, of last year, they, they connected the um, immigration system in the air, airports with the health system in order to develop contract tracing. <laughs> and also though, that they um, develop public support for the, the, their pandemic approaches through the use of humor. And here you see one, it's one of the advertisements they use with uh, focusing on a, on a dog. Um, India too has, has really tried to use technology as a way to, to um, leapfrog their, their economy. And one of their major initiatives has been Aadhaar, providing a digital identity to over 1 billion of the population, everyone over the age of five. <laughs> the, the motivation being that, that some in the rural areas, um, quite poor, but also no birth certificate, no identity, and, and a difficulty of actually engaging in, in society. Um, so with the Aadhaar number now connected to um, bank, their government's been able to provide bank accounts to 200 million poor, um, also used it for, for government payments, um, also used in, in other ways to other sorts of government benefits. And uh, India has, has shifted their, their path or really enabled technology to be part of their growth story. Um, one of the main um, themes in, in coming years is going to be the connection between um, IT and information technology and actual um, physical infrastructure. <laughs> and, and Japan uses the or calls it Society 5.0, um, somewhat related to Industry 4.0 from Germany, but, but <laughs> more society-based. But actual connections that you see already today in, in transportation systems, uh, robotics, smart houses, and smart cities, all coming together through technology, and then the application of, of, of data to, to, to better operate and, and, and manage and, and provide um, quality of, of life. Of course, this type of society has great risks for, for cybersecurity risks and, and privacy. Um, so the balance between the, the risk and the benefit, something for all societies. <laughs> Another major world trend, um, quite important in many countries is, is urbanization. <laughs> um, it's just recently, it's a picture of, of Shanghai. Just recently that over 50% of the world's population live in, in cities. You can see on this chart um, from the UN, uh, the crossing point in about 2005. Um, the number of mega cities has grown rapidly, uh, over 50 now. Um, most importantly, many of these cities are in Asia and, and, and Africa. And, and the, the challenge being oftentimes um, lower income population um, move to the outskirts of the cities and the cities have challenges providing infrastructure and services and, and also social inclusion and opportunities for, for, for jobs. Um, here you can see, I think, uh, interesting chart on the upper left from um, 1970, <coughs> population density, um, the Darker color, the, the browns are, are higher population density or, or urban, urbanization, percentage of urbanization. And, and the blues are, are less percentage of, of urbanization. And the circles represent the, the larger cities. And you can see as you progress from 1975, 1970 to 2018, and on the right to 2030, that the number of countries that are increasing, have a greatly increasing percentage of urban population. Um, so the upper left, relatively few, United States, Argentina, um, Russia, the European countries, Australia, Japan, at the bottom right, many, many, many countries around the world with significant ur urban population. And you can see the large number of cities that the orange circles in the bottom right, the mega cities in, in Asia and Africa and South America. Aging society too, a, a major issue. Um, and not, not just in, in Japan and Korea, Japan are the most aged society with over 40% of the population 65 years and older. 
Korea has had the lowest birth rate for many, many years. Uh, but countries throughout Europe, and increasingly too in the developing world, um, and middle income countries, um, North African countries have, a, have an aging society. Um, Thailand is, is rapidly aging. And in, in fact, um, many developing countries will have 15 to 20% of their population uh, 65 years and older by the year 2050. So this provides both an opportunity for technology, but also a challenge for society um, for, for development in advance of, of, of aging. And here too, similar charts, the upper left, this is the percentage of population 65 years and older, 1975 means to the United States and, and, and Europe, uh, 2020, um, the green being 25 to 30% of the population 65 and older, many, many more countries. And then 2055 on, on the right-hand side, you can see a great number of countries in Asia, um, South America, and even North Africa. Um, China too, uh, partially with the one child policy that they used to have, but, but still an, an aging society. I think this is a, <clears throat> shows the, the, the challenge for a country. This is Argentina. <clears throat> and you can see the, the young the, um, number of million of, of the younger population uh, declining over the years, zero to 19, 20 to 39, while 60 plus increasing quite rapidly, the red line. And this is uh, demographics of, of two very, very large countries, China and India. And you can see on the left, the uh, India population is, is green, <laughs> the projection to continue increasing through 2070 and 80. <laughs> the one below is, is China with a de projected declining population. <laughs> and on the right-hand side, you can see the age demographics that the China bar <laughs> shows how the China population uh, much more distributed while in India, India on the far right, uh, many, many more in, in, uh, at younger ages. Um, and then the last world trend wanted to talk about briefly is, is the chronic illness. Um, also just recently, there's been a shift from um, over half of the world mortality being for communicable disease to chronic illness. And chronic illness is, is very technology intensive. Um, and there's a need for continuity of, of care and connection between doctors, offices and hospitals and in the home. And so this too prevents a challenge for developing countries and for digital resilience. Uh, diabetes is an example, as is hepatitis um, C, <laughs> of where these diseases not just um, prevalent in, in developed countries, but also developing. Um, here's a, a chart projection for 2030, uh, prevalence of diabetes. The darker green is a greater percentage, um, very dark is greater than 12% of the population. <laughs> and you can see India and China, Saudi Arabia, um, Libya, Egypt, um, Mexico, all with very high incidence of, of, of diabetes and, and a great impact upon society, but a great need for, for technology. <laughs> okay, um, so what's providing the, 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 the benefit um, or, or the opportunity in technology? What are the underlying um, trends that enable the, the, the smartphones and the PCs and the smart cities and the smart homes. And there's, there's three main ones and the, the, the progress has been in, incredible. That the upper right is a, a data storage. <laughs> and now you can go to a, a store and, and buy a three or four terabyte uh, backup hard drive uh, for about 50 US dollars. <laughs> the first gigabyte commercially sold um, storage though, was, was only in 1980. So it seems a long time ago, but just 40 years. And it was the size of a refrigerator and weighed 550 pounds and cost $40,000. And so from refrigerator size for one gigabyte to something the size of a small book for three or four terabytes is quite incredible. And, and that trend is continuing. Um, the bottom image just of a fiber optic cable the first transatlantic cable about 100 years ago carried less than 100 simultaneous phone calls. <laughs> now the cables carry millions of phone calls simultaneously. And the, um, 
variable cost of, of a call is, is close to, to the marginal cost is close to zero. In the upper left, middle left, is processing power. Um, now the, the, the computers, seven or eight uh, billions uh, operations per second. The first Apple computer was only 1,024. And so that was about 50 years ago. Um, so these three trends enable the phone, uh, enable the PC. And, and just as 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, we couldn't have imagined um, where technology is today. I, I think that's true for 20 or 30 years into the future. Um, these type of trends will continue in, in technologies such as uh, holography and, and, and um, 5G. Um, the products that will develop from those, we, 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 it's very hard to, to, to visualize. And that's too the, the challenge and opportunity for society and government. The, the, the challenge to adopt these um, to, to be uh, current, uh, but also not not to risk falling further and further further risk falling further behind. Um, ITU uh, puts out a, used to put out a chart like this every year and in, in measuring a book they put out called Measuring the Information Society on mobile phone adoption, and the, the blue line at the, the top of the chart, 107.0, is the number of mobile phone subscriptions per 100 population worldwide. <laughs> so over um, 100, so more phone subscriptions than, than people worldwide, which is incredible. <laughs> and, and this isn't just, that's the worldwide average, but in most, in many, many, many countries, uh, even very developing countries, the percentage is, is 50, 60, 70%, of course, higher in, in urban areas than rural, uh, but a very great adoption. The orange line, I think, is even more striking, the one 69.3. Uh, that's smartphone uh, mobile broadband subscriptions. Uh, already 69.3 per 100 in 2018, <laughs> um, increasing a, a adoption worldwide um, in, in a trend that provides opportunity because it's a, almost like a computer in everyone's pocket. Um, so providing ways of, of services and government services and, and ways to operate for private sector com com companies that, that weren't possible before. Um, and, and, and 5G being adopted um, around the world, Korea and Japan, two, two of the first, uh, this with the Korea Olympics, Winter Olympics. But I think this too will provide um, But, but I, I think uh, given a John, I think uh, you were, uh, there was a distortion a little bit. Um, how is that, Shurkan? It's fine. Okay, uh, thank you. I, th I think the connection dropped um, for a short while. So how is technology, um, wh where have the impacts been seen? And I, I think th this chart's a very good, um, depiction. Um, so on, it's from uh, GSMA and McKinsey. So on the left, 39% uh, um, population in Mexico with bank accounts, 94% um, with mobile phones. And so you can see the potential for the mobile phone and actually the adoption of payment and banking services through phones just by the different difference in, in, in statistics. Um, the phone providing a means to the type of service that some of the population didn't have access to previously. Um, 
And so, of course, these type of mobile money services being adopted around the world, mo most famous in um, Kenya with, with M-Pesa. Um, the technology, not the latest technology, um, being um, um, non-smartphone technology um, using a SMS-based system, but a tremendous impact in providing for a shift. The motivation for M-Pesa in Kenya was that um, some of the population used to travel to the cities for, for work and then have to go back home with, with the, their, their, the money that they earned to bring it back to their towns and villages. Uh, and PESA enabled them to, to send the money um, directly through the phone application. And so a, 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 a need was identified. Um, Safaricom, the mobile operator, promoted uh, that application in a great adoption, not just for that now, but across Kenya. Um, countries too um, developing fiber backbone networks um, a little harder for, for um, partially based upon transoceanic cables but are also partially based upon <laughs> interconnections uh, cross border. Um, these are some of the networks going in in, in African countries <laughs> um, really important as they provide access to um, internet, but also decrease the, the, the cost of, of telecom. I'm gonna pick up speed. Here's one from Peru. Um, great success story connecting all regions of, of Peru in a manner, matter of five years called Red Dorsal and really a catalyst for their economy. Um, and as I mentioned, not all the services have to be the most current technology. This is a wonderful initiative by the Tanzanian Health Service uh, for malaria and malaria medicine, they were challenged with stockouts um, in Tanzania and set up a system where the, the local uh, clinician in, in rural area would be able to send a text message um, when there was a, before there was a stockout at the reorder point, and then the, the medicine would be replenished. And they, they decreased the stockouts from about 95% to 5% uh, um, over uh, several years. Um, Okay, some of the, the larger changes then I think over the last five years shows also how it's a little bit difficult to, to forecast, but also the importance of digital resilience and, and flexibility and adaptability. So just over the last 10 years or so, the encyclopedias have, have gone out of print. Encyclopedia Britannica had been in print for 200 years. Um, advertising, especially in newspapers has decreased and photography, the cameras, now the camera market is, is primarily through phones and that the standalone camera market, part of how they advertise is, is internet connectivity. So a complete shift, um, but, but showing to the need for, for agility. Let's take that one. Um, one point I, I think for companies and universities and, and countries is it's not just technology, it's the uh, leadership and, and policy also the leadership and policy coming together with technology to provide the, 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 the services and, and the digital resiliency. And so on the left-hand side, the um, y-axis is, is policy and technology, the, the policy and uh, leadership capability, the, the, the complements of technology, and the x-axis is technology. And you can see that some countries do better in, in policy. Uh, for example, um, Malawi on the far left, uh, much better on policy than on the technology. <laughs> and then some much better on, on the, the technology, less on the policy, for example, on uh, Guatemala. And then some countries, the ones that do really well with technology are, are uh, good with, with both. So you can see Germany, New Zealand, Sweden, Netherlands, US, South Korea, Japan at the upper right. Um, so that's the um, importance of, of University of Central Asia and, 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 and universities uh, in, in, in developing uh, technology leaders and, and technology practitioners, but also technology aware um, citizens and, and residents um, so that both the, the complements and the technology are there together. And then governments also adopting technology. Many have a, a roadmap similar to this one for Taiwan, going from a computerization of, of government on the left uh, providing services, for example, e-Taiwan, 
a ubiquitous part anytime, anywhere, you Taiwan with the mobile phone, and then an, a view of an intelligent uh, society, connections between mobile and, and, and computer and, and, and physical. Let's get that. Okay, um, so some of the specifics of the newer technologies, I uh, wanted to, to address uh, three or four in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, AI, I think one of the most important ones, both opportunities and risks. <laughs> this is an example from um, Korea of uh, Watson, the uh, IBM um, AI system, but being used for um, cancer diagnosis. <laughs> so <laughs> benefit of, of AI is the ability to um, take very, very large data sets, um, analyze the data sets, to develop a, a, a view um, of the connections and the connectivity um, and to have some sort of a conclusion. Um, and that's the opportunity, but also the risks because, it, because if the data sets aren't representative um, or if they're biased in some way, then, then, the, then the results won't be on point, um, which has been some of the, the challenge with the, the, the cancer research. Um, in medical journals today, every month, um, many, many articles about AI. This is one from several months ago on AI and oncology and cancer research. Um, very, very important for the future to AI operating in, in conjunction with phys physicians um, for, for diagnosis and recommendations for, for, for treatment. Um, AI is, is, is not new. This is from about um, 50 years ago. Some of the first systems were called expert systems. And so experts such as physicians would, would sit down with computer programmers and describe how they make a decision or how they make a diagnosis uh, with a series of if-then statements. And these were codified into expert systems. There were two early ones. One was reading mass spectrogram, spect, um, spectroscopy, or mass spectrograms. And the other one was on um, diagnosing um, in a uh, bacterial infection. Um, and then about 20 years ago, um, the, in the news, one of the more, uh, in the news items for AI was when uh, the IBM Deep Blue system, um, chess playing system defeated um, Gary Kasparov, the world champion from Russia in, in, in a, a chess match. Um, so the way these programs worked is they uh, very, very, very powerful computers. Uh, they looked into the future uh, and they had a weighting algorithm that was uh, programmed by, by humans, by computer scientists working with uh, grandmasters. Um, somewhat similar to the expert system from 50 years ago. Um, and IBM, after the deep blue experience, wanted to uh, develop more of a AI that could uh, benefit society and it wasn't as limited to one game such as chess. And they applied it to the um, game show in the US called Jeopardy, um, where there's a series of, of questions and answers. And so the computer had access to, to information from around the world, pro program um, read in, um, and then did very well actually in, in, in the game. So a, a broader application than, than chess. But AI today is somewhat different. Uh, so you may have read or read about um, the Google efforts uh, and the chess playing program Alpha Zero, but now playing Go also uh, and, and Shogi. And so here, the humans didn't work with the um, grandmasters to program in algorithms uh, and waiting algorithms. What they did instead was the computer played itself uh, millions of games and, and, and developed its own view through um, deep learning um, of, of, of how to play. And it's, it's, it's a different type of play than, than the other type of um, AI systems, such as the Deep Blue system or, or some of the other programs now, Stockfish, uh, use for, for um, chess playing. Uh, so really quite interesting, this idea of a, of a computer playing itself <coughs> or, or having this adversarial approach, uh, and then through that, having some type of learning. Um, so you can imagine the uh, applications for this, even in cybersecurity, <laughs> one computer being the attacker and one the defender. Um, so there's benefits for, for 
companies and governments in cybersecurity defense, but of course, too, there's, there's risks of, of, of hackers using a similar approach to find ways to, to breach systems. Uh, and then there's a view for the future of more general purpose AI. A lot of what we see is, is in movies, uh, some quite famous, such as Terminator on the upper left. <laughs> the one on the lower right from the 1920s, also a somewhat famous, famous movie, where, where uh, AI is almost human-like uh, in autonomy and decisions. Um, many, many, many startups, you can see here just in healthcare, uh, clinical trials, connected devices, imaging. Um, so there's gonna be a shift in, in, in healthcare, but the, as I mentioned, the challenge being, how will the AI work in conjunction with, with humans? I think this is true um, in many, many fields. Um, one, one last point, this is uh, the Apple Watch. Um, and so it's um, approved by the US Food and Drug Administration, the, um, who oversees uh, medical devices and pharmaceuticals um, <laughs> for identifying uh, heart, heart murmurs and heart fib fibrillations. Um, has actually helped many, many people um, from that. I'll skip that. <laughs> um, Oh, one, one last point here. Um, so with the smartphone, the, the, the smartphone, everyone uses their smartphone differently and you can identify a person uniquely. Uh, the smartphone also has many, many sensors. So this is a, an initiative um, for Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's <laughs> early identification using the, the, the smartphone plus sensors for, for balance and, and, and tremor to, for early identification of, of Alzheimer and, and, and Parkinson's. Um, so you can see all of this information together, but it has to be um, calibrated and validated. And so that's where the trials uh, play a big role, but the potential is, is, is enormous. Um, and here's a, a last example of uh, the adversarial um, learning uh, sometimes the data sets, the size of the data sets is too small. Here's an example from um, University of Toronto where, where they had the computer uh, develop uh, lung images. Um, and then they, they show those lung images, the computer generated ones to uh, at the AI system. And it was at, at some point the, the system wasn't able to distinguish the real from the, the generated ones. And so this enables the generation of much larger data sets. <laughs> okay, um, to, to wrap up with a little bit on, on robotics and also on um, open data. Um, robotics is, is also a tremendous opportunity, but, but challenge too. Um, and there's a shift in, in, in what robots are and what they look like. Um, so the, the traditional view of a robot is on the bottom right, the industrial robot, <clears throat> which is anchored very large, but anchored in one place um, and, and doing a very complicated, but, but limited set of, of tasks. Um, the robots are, are becoming much more mobile, as you can see on the bottom left, an English teaching robot in Korea. And, and there's gonna be much more interactions with, with humans. Um, so a great policy, many great policy questions related to this and safety questions. Um, one area where it comes greatly into play, we showed the chart of India and China with India having a, a, rap, a growing population to 1.75 million people um, through the 2075 and China, a decreasing population. So for China, robotics, a big benefit um, as their population declines um, to augment the workforce and help them maintain productivity, similarly with Korea and Japan. But in a country like India with a rapidly growing population, uh, robotics, an opportunity, but a risk because the economy has to provide new jobs for a great many more people. Um, some of the areas, this is a assistive robot in Japan. <coughs> uh, robots playing a, a big role in, in, in healthcare um, with the aged, but also during times of COVID um, in, in hospitals. Um, where, where there's a risk of, of illness and, and disease, robots being able to transport things, but also able to interact with uh, patients. Uh, 
This also another Japanese robot um, for uh, autism and, and, and um, uh, memory issues in, in the elderly. Uh, it's very interactive and the, um, the para robot company consciously chose this shape because uh, people are able to uh, relate to it quite well. Um, here's another example of, of an assistive robot, um, again in Japan, uh, being able to carry a, a person. Also provides for um, safety. There, there's many, many um, injuries annually in hospitals from, from patients um, dropping from, from, from beds and, and transfer. Um, related to robots is drones, and I think this is a fantastic story too, and benefits both um, developing and developed countries. Um, so related to the um, autonomous vehicle technology of cars, that is the drone technology. Um, so many, many technology applications, especially in, in, in rural countries or countries with big rural areas, uh, but also in industrial applications where there's great uh, risks to, to, to people. Um, so here's an application in, in Rwanda, which is a very um, mountainous country uh, for drug delivery uh, to remote areas. Uh, remote towns and, and, and villages, uh, a fixed wing drone, but able to, to make a trip in, in several hours uh, compared to much, much longer time across the mountainous roads. Um, here's one at our university, uh, George Mason. Uh, this is from an Estonian company, but, but for um, food service delivery across the campus. It works almost like the um, car service Uber or Lyft, where you um, order through the mobile phone, you're able to track the progress of the robot to where you are, and, and then you have a code to, to open it, and, and the delivery is there. Um, here, too, for resilience and, and disaster, drones being used for um, post-disaster. Here's a flooding in Houston and Texas in the U.S. last year, um, where the drones were used for, for early identification, both of uh, damage, but also of, of need where people were stranded. And drones too, more and more for uh, transportation. Here's um, <laughs> service um, had been launched in uh, Dubai, um, initially piloted, but for drone services from the airport to um, the city. <laughs> you see opportunity for this in places where the airports are quite remote. For example, Narita in, in, in Tokyo, uh, able to transport population. Um, and then the driving it is, um, rapidly advancing. Um, there is both fully autonomous vehicle driving, more and more being adopted with, with trucks, but there's also driver assist. Uh, this is from Toyota Research Institute, um, providing AI capability where the driver's um, abilities are, are lessened or, or uh, due to either fog or, or rain uh, or, or, or sleet. And so enhancing safety and some of the country's goals now, um, zero deaths through, very ambitious, but zero deaths through, through driving, but enabled through the smart transport, transportation and automated vehicles. And lastly, I'd like to wrap up with um, open data. Many countries um, doing interesting things with this. <laughs> um, many countries have open data policies, <laughs> providing data sets to the public, uh, and then private sector companies repackaging the data um, for, for, for use um, for, for the citizens and, 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 and residents. Um, New York has done, New York also has a system called 311. So you dial just the numbers 311 on the phone and you have a switchboard and it provides you a connection to all city services and they tabulate the information which um, actually helps them manage the, the, the city. Uh, that's just the, the logo. Um, here you can see They've collated all the service requests um, from 2010 to, to present, and you can see typical city type things, uh, illegal parking and, and noise, um, but very helpful in management and very helpful as it's a very large city um, with, with a lot of, um, well, a very large city with, with um, much need for, for services over the course of a, of a day. Um, and here you can see over a 24 hour period uh, the, 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 the calls coming in um, to the 311 center. 
And so you can see damaged trees, sewer complaints during the, the day. Uh, at night, obviously enough more and more noise and blocked driveway and taxi complaints. So this is at the city level, but also at the country level, um, open data having a big impact. And I think it's had a benefit in, in COVID, in COVID uh, resilience too in many countries because the infrastructure being in place, the, the digital infrastructure in place and then able to utilize that uh, in combating COVID. Um, let's skip that. And then here, here's an example with a, a map. This was a, an issue in New York of, of blocked bike lanes, which are quite dangerous in a city like that because uh, the, the bikes didn't have to go out into the traffic. And this is over a period of time, the, the, the calls and the, the, the complaints. Um, so with that, I'd like to, to, to thank you very much for, for joining a, a really quick uh, tour. Um, but University of Central Asia and, and, and Shaka Ali Khan um, doing tremendously and, and um, tremendous opportunity and benefit for everyone with, with technology, but also uh, risk due to digital divide and, 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 and cybersecurity um, and, and privacy risk. Um, so I wish all you well and, and thank you. Uh, thank you very much, John, for such an inspiring and interesting presentation and, and your thoughts about uh, emerging technologies. Uh, we have a couple of uh, questions uh, coming and uh, for the audience, uh, I would request if you have any questions, then just uh, write your question in the Q&A section. And uh, I have received some questions from social media also. The first question is, with all the emerging technologies, uh, how the academy is responding to, how, how the curriculum part, and then how they are preparing for the new students who are graduating from the university. What are your thoughts in this? Oh, that, that, that's a, 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 a very good question. I, I, I think um, universities are able to stay current um, through partnerships with industry and, and government and, and, and through um, joint research, but also at, at advisory boards. Um, so through that and through periodic curriculum reviews um, that the universities up update, not just the, the technical curriculum, but also the, the business and policy curriculum. And, and so it's a holistic view of, of society and, and, and um, staying in current and in touch with um, industry and government and with alumni and, and then utilizing that to update the curriculum. I think there's also more and more of um, informal education in, in lifelong learning. Um, so these technologies change rapidly and, and ones that someone learned 10 years ago may not be um, that current today. And so providing opportunities through speaker series such as this, uh, certificates, uh, universities also playing a, a big role um, in, in, in staying current. Uh, thank you, John. Another question is about uh, the uh, data the privacy. Uh, with these all emerging technologies, we are talking about data uploading and using data. So are there any global mechanism which is uh, uh, actually controlling the data privacy, uh, especially to secure the citizens' uh, data? Well, I think um, not, not, not yet. I, I think there's some countries that have very good initiatives. Um, in a, one fantastic European Union project um, where the, the, the trial cities were uh, Amsterdam and, and, and Barcelona. And, and the motivation for it was that there's, all, there's this data from uh, IoT uh, and from smart city type applications. And Barcelona established a um, data commons overseen by the, the citizenry. Um, and they also set up a quite strict approach to uh, contracting with the private sector companies as to the use of data. Um, and so I think that's a, a model and, and, and a success story. Um, in contrast to that, uh, Google had a project with uh, Toronto called K-Side, um, where it was going to be a, a, a redevelopment uh, along the waterfront. Um, and their uh, privacy issues played a big role in that project not continuing. Uh, because they didn't provide the, there wasn't confidence that the safeguards were in place uh, for the for the citizens and residents who would have moved there. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, we have another question. Uh, can you share with us the real projects with some technical realization where your team is taking part of, 
and how you use open data and technologies in such realizations or R and D. Um, you know, one one project we're we're working on it's it's again with um, um, Alzheimer's. Um, it, it, it's the our National Institute of, of Health. Um, they provide access to uh, anonymized uh, health data sets. Um, and, and so the, those data sets provide a basis for, for understand, uh, developing insights into genetic, genetic connections to, to disease. And so I think those type of initiatives for these large data sets have been showed real promise and, and, and we've been working on some of those. Thank you. Uh, and because I'm from the University of Central Asia, so just one question from uh, my end. What would be your advice for the University of Central Asia and other institutions in Central Asia to, uh, to prepare our students, our curriculum towards these uh, uh, emerging technologies? Um, and one, well, there's the, the curriculum itself and, and, and tied to um, and the employment opportunities, but, but also tied to potential for, for innovation and, and um, entrepreneurship. And, and then um, also a big part, I, I think, is the informal learning like, like this, but, but also opportunity for um, internships and, and, and cooperative um, student learning uh, with, 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 with companies. So I think government plus the, the universities plus uh, private sector together um, or, or what enable really, really good learning. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. John Perry uh, Fred, uh, for an exciting presentation. Thank you for your time. And thank you everyone uh, for attending this session.